Hi, and welcome to Power of 10, a podcast about design operating at many levels, zooming out from thoughtful detail through to organizational transformation and onto changes in society and the world. My name's Andy Pollain. I'm a service design and innovation consultant, educator, and writer. Our guest today is Molly Wright Steenson, a designer, author, professor, and international speaker whose work focuses on the intersection of design, architecture, and artificial intelligence, a topic more relevant than ever today. She is the Senior Associate Dean for Research in the College of Fine Arts, the K&L Gates Associate Professor of Ethics and Computational Technologies, and an Associate Professor in the School of Design, all at Carnegie Mellon University. And as if that wasn't enough, she is the author of Architectural Intelligence, How Designers and Architects Created the Digital Landscape, and co-editor of Bauhaus Futures, both published by MIT Press. Even better, Molly owns the best domain name ever, which we'll reveal <laughs> at the end of the show. Molly, welcome to Power of Ten. Hi, Andy. It's good to be here. I'm, I'm looking at you sitting in front of lots and lots of books, so I'm assuming <laughs> uh, you do quite a lot of work from home anyway. Well, I'm I'm a writer as well as a professor, So, but I have to say I just succeeded at getting 15 boxes of books to my office at school, and just as I finished the last box of books, <laughs> coronavirus hit. So oh. now I, I had to bring back a couple more bags here and we're all living living in distributed times but yeah, i think that that's yeah. the worst the worst complaint i have right now my dog very much likes the invention of stay stay at home and shelter in place yeah i'm pretty sure it's a uh, conspiracy by pets yeah to, definitely. to just get um to get people <laughs> to their owners to stay at home now you've talked about yourself as an old school web geek, and you know since 1994, I've worked in many capacities as a UX designer and strategist, design researcher, writer, and geek. And you said you built the first news delivering website at Reuters in 1995, which, which and managed the second most hit page on the internet. That's such a it's true. that's such a telling kind of uh, expression these days. Even the fact you said the most hit page. So tell me a little bit about that history. Okay, so it's a long, strange history, and I promise you that it all comes together in the present moment. I was a kid who had an Apple IIe computer at home. I'm now 48 years old, so that kind of gives you an idea of, of where I fall. I'm a child of the you 70s and it. 80s, somewhere. <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> and all my silly if-then statements in my programs. Mm. And I, uh, when I was... In college at university, I majored in German, but I also did a lot of writing for the various newspapers at the University of Wisconsin, where I went to college. And uh, one of those papers was The Onion. I wrote for the AV Club. A number of us who were connected with these various projects got involved with the first web project at the University of Wisconsin. Um, it was called Online Wisconsin. It was an online newspaper in 1994. And uh, I guess October of 1994, I had an epiphany that, oh my God, this web thing was going to be huge and I wanted to do it for a living and I needed to move to San Francisco or New York and fast before it was too late. All of us who worked on that project went on to really interesting um, jobs. Pam became the production editor at Wired. Roger was on the founding team of CNET. I landed at a subsidiary of Reuters in New York as a manager of online services, which was funny because my previous job was working in a record store. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I had this management position right out of, right out of uh, university. It was just really amazing because you could make things happen. And from there, I moved to California. I was Howard Reingold's first employee at his startup, Electric Minds. Wow. And then I left Electric Minds before launch and worked at Netscape with Hugh Dubberly, where oh, I was really? world's... Uh. Yes, I, indeed, indeed. And this figures into where we go with the architecture book. I should also mention that my undergraduate honors thesis was about the Bauhaus and its connection to sustainability some way or another yeah. um, through landscape architecture. And so I was no stranger to architectural history. And um, in my first day at Netscape, Hugh Dubberly suggested in 1996, he suggested that we use pattern languages, this idea from Christopher Alexander in how we think of redesigning the Netscape website. Yeah. So I thought that was interesting here. I'm hearing about architecture and we're working on something with the web in 1996. And, you know, I think a year later, 
late, no, later that year, I heard the phrase information architecture for my first time when I was working at a company called CKS Interactive. And yeah. we looked at Werman's information architects book for inspiration. So fast forward through a career that takes me through, you know, e-business consulting through being one of the first content strategists and UX leads or customer experience architects 20 years ago, and to being a professor at the Interaction Design Institute Ivrea in Italy, which you might know about. I know from, yeah, from Ben and Labyrinth, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So Ben and Labyrinth um, were graduates of the Royal College of Art, the first service designers in the Interaction Design Institute Ivrea, and they taught on our course with us. They were very, very important visitors and project yeah. leaders. After I taught at Ivrea for two years, I came back to the U.S. and I knew I didn't want to go back and work on Web 2.0 stuff. Yeah. Being at Ivrea introduced me to classes like Buildings as Interface, right. which was taught by Stefano Mirti. And yeah. if you're in Italy, all designers are trained as architects. And we lived in this, you know, just absolutely amazing structure called Talponia by the architects Gabetti and Isola. And I knew I wanted to study how technology feel, fit into the world around us. And so I turned down a job at Yahoo and I went to Yale and I did a master's in architectural history. And then I used the many people from that program went on to the PhD program at Princeton right. And that's where I started researching the history of AI and cybernetics and architecture. So what kind of, about what time was that? I was at Ivrea in, from the very beginning of 2003 to the very end of 2004. So two years right. in there. And, and then I came back to the U.S. in 2005 and started right. my master's and PhD. So the, the architecture academic part of my career began right. 15 years and ago. The, and the AI bit, then you were you were pretty early in not in AI yeah. in general, but you were pretty early in what we're now kind of thinking of the the sudden rise of of interest in AI and machine learning right now. Um, you yeah, were, you were sort of involved in thinking about that earlier. Okay, and I think I may have been one of the first people to draw the connection between Christopher Alexander AI and um, the work that we also do in UX and interaction design. Right, so let's go there because in architectural architectural intelligence i you know i i know my hci and interaction design history pretty well i somehow missed that nicholas negroponte was an architect i don't know how i managed to miss that but that that bit had sort of escaped me when i in my sort of readings over the years but yeah. you you run through a kind of list of there's this conference where you know people like Doug Engelbart were and you, you talk about Terry Winograd later on. If if for any of the younger listeners that are out there, um, <laughs> these are all names that you should know about. So yeah, I, yeah, no, this is seriously this is actually a bit of a thing. So before I'm going to come back, I'm going to have a little bit of a, a gripe, which is in any other field. You, know, you you kind of one of the things you learn is about your history. If you go and you go and become a fine artist, you you learn about you know the old masters. You learn about kind of the whole history of art and and so forth. And the same is true in in actual product design of, of industrial design and, and product physical product design and so forth. You learn about all that stuff. And one of my biggest kind of gripes about people who are working in in loosely sort of digital these days and in interaction design and UX is a lot of them actually don't know that history very much. And part of the reason is because most of it's disappeared uh, from the internet. And so a lot of the work, I mean, you've probably had this too. We were talking about your Apple II before and your if-then statements. Or my Maxi, you know. which is a whole set of, of things, the webzine that I ran that has disappeared right. from the so, internet. So all of that stuff is, you know, I mean, all of my work, I keep a really old Apple laptop around so I can actually occasionally, you know, play some of the work I did for a good kind of decade or more of my career is no longer accessible. And mm -hmm. so there's this kind of cliff of history that is constantly kind of moving and so until the web happened and then, you know, now it just becomes a kind of the opposite problem where there's so much stuff out there, you have to find it. So that's my rant aside. Tell me how the architectural stuff comes together. Because you, you, you start to say, well, you know, there's all these architects who are, who are actually really influential in the thinking around the, the internet. And it was a really interesting, fascinating connection. So how does that all work? Um a number of ways. So for me, this journey started, remember how I told you about Hugh Doberly mentioning mm. Christopher Alexander back in 1996. So what, 20, 24 years ago now, I, everybody in interaction design, and for that matter, software engineering, software 
development seems to love Christopher Alexander. Um, architects, uh-huh. incidentally, don't like him very much, which is interesting <laughs> and strange. But I started following that. I wanted to I wanted to understand what it was about Christopher Alexander that. I wanted to understand what was in his work. And so Mm. I read notes on the synthesis of form for the first time in 2007. This was uh, written by him in 19, I think originally 1961. And then it was published in 1964, the published version of his dissertation at Harvard. Mm. And the book is really interesting for its footnotes. So like you could almost (laughs) read the back half of it and and see all the things that he's trying to put together as people do in dissertations, right? And I noticed at the end of the first chapter, the very end of the first chapter, he said something. He, He wrote, we must face the fact that we are on the brink of times when man may be able to magnify his intellectual and inventive capability, just as in the 19th century, he used machines to magnify his physical capacity. Again, as then, our innocence is lost. And again, of course, the innocence once lost cannot be regained. The loss demands attention, not denial. So he wrote that. And the footnote for that statement says the possibility of amplifying intelligence has already been hint- hinted at by Ross Ashby, designed for an intelligence amplifier, Claude Shannon and John McCarthy. See also Marvin Minsky steps toward artificial intelligence. Right. And I thought, well, that's really strange because there, it, it, in the early to mid 2000s, there was a lot of writing happening in 20th century architectural history about cybernetics. In fact, cybernetics on any number of things. I took a class at Yale on cybernetics and literature, Mm. you know, systems theory and literature. And in particular, because of the work of the British architect, Cedric Price, who had died in 2003 and who'd done a lot of work with cybernetics, this was coming up a lot for me at that time. But artificial intelligence was not. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's fascinating. And so after that, I started reading Marvin Minsky. Claude Shannon, I, I am not a math person, so you know I, I'm at a loss when it comes to most things with advanced equations. With John McCarthy, with Ross Ashby, all the people that he notes there. And I started tracing back through their work. And as a result of that, I also began to find my way to Nicholas Negroponte and the Architecture Machine Group at MIT. And Nicholas Negroponte in the late 1960s, well, let's see. He graduated from MIT with his bachelor's in 65, 66. He got his master's. Five days later, he started teaching at MIT, <laughs> taking over Stephen Kunz's course. Wow. And what that meant was also that he began working. So Stephen Kunz was in mechanical engineering, but he also began working with the AI lab. He was very close friends with Marvin Minsky till Minsky's death and with Seymour Papert and was very closely engaged with the AI lab at MIT. Basically, the architecture machine group was building and experimenting with interfaces for artificial intelligence at that at that point in time. And um, indeed, Christopher Alexander's an architect, Nicholas Negroponte is an architect, Richard Saul Werman's an architect, and all these people were working with information, cybernetics, or artificial intelligence in some way or another as material for architecture. And that had really profound influences for the kind of work that you and I do today. Yeah. In what way then? Our fields don't exist without it. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm deliberately sort of asking, I mean, I I have some pretty good understanding, but explain why that's had such an influence on us. Because there is a bit of a leap from, you know, that group of people being interested in this and then where we are now. And there's a kind of, like I said, there's a bit of a cliff of history that um, oh, yeah. is not so well known. Oh, yeah. Well, I very much agree with you on the history front. And I hope we could we could circle back to that because, yeah. you know, when, when we say things like artificial intelligence or AI and act like this is a brand new shining term, it's a term that's almost old enough to have social security in the United States. It was coined <laughs> in 1955 by John McCarthy. And machine learning was popularized as a term starting in 1952. So these are these are terms that are eligible for retirement, you know, and yeah. we're, we're treating them as though they're very new. I think that can be harmful 
if we don't acknowledge that there are lessons to be learned from a long history of things that haven't worked in AI before and why they haven't worked, probably more importantly. But in the case of the, you asked about the connection to architecture and Christopher Alexander is the architect that a lot of computer scientists have known about, but they, you know, without knowing about other architects, they seem to gravitate toward him. So people like Alan Cooper, um, who is, of course, a computer scientist at the at the end of it all, or yeah. Ward Cunningham or Kent Beck, used to read Christopher Alexander in their school libraries or university bookstores because his books are really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, Beck would actually read them in the university bookstore bit by bit. And when he and Ward Cunningham were working on small talk in the late 1980s, I think 1987, 88, they realized that they could use they could use pattern languages as a way to codify the programming languages they were developing. So let's just pause there. So pattern language is a pretty crucial one. Christopher Alexander wrote a pattern language. Yeah. Can you do a sort of summary of what Christopher Alexander was talking about? It's not just him, is it? There's a couple of other authors as well. Many other um, authors. Yeah when they're talking about what a pattern language is. So Christopher Alexander joined the faculty at UC Berkeley in 19, I forget exactly what year, but in the 1960s. And um, he and his colleagues founded what's called the Center for Environmental Structure. And they started trying to find a way that they could sort of codify knowledge about design at every scale So I I like the fact that you're talking about powers of 10 being designed at every scale. And this is what they were trying to do from uh, the smallest details of where you put things in a house to how you structure a nation state. And they published a book called A Pattern Language in 1977. And then Alexander at the same time published kind of the philosophy of it, which was called The Timeless Way of Building. And you could think of a pattern language as an operating system for architecture and what he and um, his colleagues, Sarah Ishikawa and Marie Silverstein said, they define patterns as a, a, it describes a problem which occurs over and over again in our environment and then describes the core of the solution to that problem in such a way that you can use the solution a million times over without ever using it the same way twice. So, um, so each pattern has kind of a grammar. It's got a number. It places it in a hierarchy. There's a title. There's a photo. There's a problem statement. There's some more information describing the pattern, sort of sketches along the way showing how it works out and uh, how, how, how to explain how it connects to other patterns in the hierarchy. So, you know, it's almost kind of hyperlinked in that yeah, sense. Yeah. And so he sees patterns, or they, excuse me, they see patterns as networked, right? It's a network of patterns. Yeah. This idea was really, really influential for and impactful for computer scientists. So I mentioned Ward Cunningham and Kent Beck, and they brought that idea over to object-oriented programming languages. By the early 1990s, about 1994, the book Design Patterns and Software was published. And now there are something like 1,400 books on Amazon that refer to design patterns in some capacity. That's not an exaggeration. But there are two other ways that that picks up. One is in extreme programming and agile. So Alexander's theory was uh, direct implementation or the, excuse me, agile software methods and development methods are a direct implementation of Alexander's ideas about putting down a set of patterns that aren't definite, but that begin to allow you to sort of design from the center out and provide a flexibility in the design process that Kent Beck says is a a rearrangement of the politics of design, basically. And the other thing that it influenced was the wiki. Ward (laughs) Cunningham applied Alexander's idea of patterns and, you know, a a conversation that has a center but no edge to the idea of the wiki that we all use in things like Wikipedia. So direct connection. And he also really influenced Terry Winograd for how we think of software and the idea of user experience designing for 
being inside of a space of software, like understanding user inhabiting a system. And that's a direct interpretation of Christopher Alexander as well. But it's also, uh, pattern language also seems to be a, it's almost the sort of genesis of open source as well. As far mm-hmm. as I understand it, there's a, a sort of democratizing force behind the idea of it, that you're giving this set of patterns and tools that people should be able to use. There's a bit I'm sort of reading a quote of where it says, at the core is the idea that people should design their home, streets and community. And this idea comes from the observation that most of the wonderful places in the world were not made by architects, but by the people. And it's very, not only sort of human centered, but it's very much of a sort of this idea of you give people the the toolbox and the tools and they will then start to uh, create the things that work for them. Architects hate Christopher Alexander. <laughs> for that reason. Um, they Well, they hate him for all kinds of reasons. And I can't entirely <laughs> figure out why. I think they protest too much. I mean, right. for all of the people in the world that are are kind of jerks as human beings, for all of the egos that are in architecture, I don't know that, our, yeah. that Christopher Alexander is public enemy number one. Do you think it's partly because he, he sort of dethrones the architect as kind of auteur of the kind of whole thing yeah. in, in pattern language? Do you think that's one of the reasons why? It could be. You know, the probably the most interesting part is maybe it's a sort of clickishness. So the architect Peter Eisenman, um, who is who was trained in many of the same places as Alexander and interested in math in some of the same ways that Alexander was. His there are people who've drawn a lot of parallels that connect Eisenman and Alexander, although Eisenman says the reason he did a PhD was because he hated Christopher Alexander so much. I mean, <laughs> these are men who are now almost 90 years old. So, you know, it gives you an idea of how long so much hate, around. But it's led to some no amazing idea. things. I'm conscious of time. So let's move to Doug Engelbart. There's, mm. there's loads of other people who are involved. But Doug Engelbart, well, the in, in, inventor of the mouse, inventor of so many things. In mm-hmm. fact, I'll try and find a link to the, uh, his presentation. It's pretty amazing. The oh, yeah, the mother of all demos. The, um, right, so the mother of all demos. I'll, I'll put that in the show notes. If people haven't seen it, uh, they should listen. They should have a look at it. And they should also listen to Mark Pesci talking about this because it's pretty interesting. So perhaps you can describe what... Uh, it's, can you, in a couple of sentences, describe kind of what Doug was sort of getting at? Because, and he was using architectural scenarios as the kind of demos for this. Because I, I want to get onto the clock yeah, kind of thing. Yeah. So this is this is way back, even before Sketchpad was invented, or well, I shouldn't say invented, but this is like sixty-eight. I, we're talking sixty-seven. In, in, 68, I'm something. talking about earlier than that. I'm, right, I'm right. talking about the ideas that precede the mother of all demos. It was 1962 that Douglas Engelbart published this scenario in a paper that, in a report he produced called Augmenting Human Intellect. Yes. Um, yeah. Let's pause for a second and note that a lot of times today we talk about augmenting humans and augmenting artificial yeah. intelligence versus automating. This goes yeah. back to at least 1962, if not earlier. Yeah. So again... Yeah. A very old idea. But augmenting human intellect was basically his proposal for what would eventually become this amazing mother of all demos, this kind of online system that would connect different user interfaces and different pathways through information. But his use case was architectural. Right. And he described a, you know, basically a computer-aided design system that that had some element of BIM of building information modeling built into it. Right. <laughs> So at the same time, I mean, he's kind of in the, in the mother of all demos. He's he's kind of basically describing what we're all suddenly doing now. Um, yeah. he's, he describes the web. He describes the internet. He describes yeah. a lot of the kind of interface. But he also describes people working together, right, and working together at a distance. It so does. he's 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 gone. I, I mean, it is remarkable. I mean, it is really worth seeing that watching that demo because you you have this moment of oh my god, you know, he's he's kind of in one swoop sort of demonstrated kind of everything that we take for granted now but then you're talking about let's move on to the clock because we need to get onto the ai bit so t- tell us about this idea of he talks about a clock so this kind of helper that kind of helps you do stuff right yep i'm looking to see if i can i just published something uh in this book about Engelhart, oh. actually and about the mother of all demos 
Um, but yeah, you know, that he would have this, here's, here's how he describes it. So Engelbart writes in 1962, he sits, this is the virtual architect. He sits at a working station that has a visual display, some three feet on a side. This is his working surface and is controlled by a computer, his clerk, which he, with which he can communicate by means of a small keyboard and other various devices. He is designing a building. He has already dreamed up several basic layouts and structural forms and is trying them out on the screen. So why is Douglas Engelbart not an architect using architecture in 1962 to talk about what a computer system can do? That was my question. (laughs) What's up with that? (laughs) Well, there are a couple of reasons. One is, I think one is opportunistic, right? Architects were a really good use case for the development of early computing, symbolic logic, representation, inputs and outputs, because you need all of those things to do design well, right? You know, I've got to laugh because right now we're in a situation where architecture and design schools are on Zoom for, yeah. because we're all working from, from home and we're still grappling with making everything happen yeah. On a computer, and yet so much design does, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other thing, though, is that architects build worlds. And I think that system builders, computer system builders, AI researchers, interface designers, early information architects have all envisioned themselves as we're building worlds too. And so that's why it's so attractive to look at architecture as your use case. But I mean, the. Equally, you could some of those things you just said about architecture also would have been true of say industrial design or aircraft or automotive design and so forth. Why why architecture? Was it just the kind of people he knew he was hanging out with back then, or was it, is it deeper than that? I don't think that actually, from a perspective of how the technology develops in those fields, that they're separate. Mechanical engineering and aircraft design are where augmented reality comes from. And, you know, the, the complex engineering that you see today in Frank Gehry's work or Greg Lynn's work comes from an engagement with mechanical engineering and different kinds of modeling yeah. that, that take place. So I, I don't think those are discrete kind of chunks of, of professions, the way that maybe universities see those things. They're actually much more fluid, but it yeah. is way, way more sexy to talk about the building of a world than it is about the the working of a beast line or or you know how you yeah, make an yeah, airplane okay. wing. <laughs> well, it depends depends on what floats your boat. But I, I can see I can see how that yeah I can see the, the the attraction. There's also a thing though in there about this idea of they're talking about this idea of you know architecture is also about the communication of information across networks, and so therefore architects yeah. have to kind of consider you know, the theory of networks. And you just talked about academic institutions. One of the things that ironically stops academic institutions being more interdisciplinary is is the architecture, right? You've got these people in this department. You've got these people in this department. So you've got these intellectual fields that are related related to each mm-hmm. other, separated physically. And of course, famously, you know, MIT threw that up in the air. Oh, well, many, or or my own my own university does too. Yeah. I believe we have the top ranked machine learning program in the country, if not the world. Right. It might be worth talking just for a second about what it's like to do innovation within a university construct, yeah, right? Yeah. That that I think that the depth is necessary that one gets into being specialized, say, in industrial design versus architecture, but. On the other hand, you don't build really amazing, groundbreaking things with people who are exactly like you. You need difference. And yeah, in yeah. in this history that I, I've written about and that I've spent so many years researching about AI and the development of computation and architecture, it was having really interesting problems to solve that made it attractive to design computing systems for architecture, to have architects involved in designing yeah. for AI. But despite all the egos in architecture that you talked about before, you you also need a, a sort of psychological uh, safe space and some professional humility to properly work with people from other disciplines, right? You you have to be interested in the way they see the world, not trying to fit the way they see the world into your existing box, right? I think so. I think, you know, I, I've worked in academia for quite uh, a, a number of years too and I think that's one of the things it's one of the things I kind of always missed a bit from the commercial world is 
I think there is quite a lot more of that, despite there's a lot of jostling in academia too, that's for sure. So going back, so Engelbart's got his this idea of this clerk that is uh, a, kind of a helper and if effectively augmenting your, your intellect, also sort of doing tasks for you. Uh, I was going to say that's like the kind of the Siri of, of his world, but it's, it's, it's more than that. And lead us on to how you go from there into the, that's the beginnings of kind of AI and uh, humans working together, or at least the idea of it. Lead us that to where you are now with AI and ethics. So, I, okay, there's, there's another architect to be sure to raise, and that's the work of Cedric Price. You know, I, I write about the, the book is essentially four chapters about white men who are architects who worked in <laughs> yes, technology. I, I did notice that. I did notice that. Uh, yeah. Well, I made a pretty a pretty long uh, mention it, yeah. at the beginning yeah. about about the fact that there were women and uh, yeah, again, if I were going to write a book like this again, I don't know that I'd write it. Yeah. There are a lot of problems about the MIT Media Lab, and I think about the innovation culture and the culture of fundraising at uh, that university in particular that we all know about in the wake of Jeffrey Epstein, the yeah, sex yeah, trafficker, yeah. Joey Ito's decisions, and some things that Nicholas Negroponte have said that make me not really want to pursue that line of research anymore or write about right. MIT anymore. But, you know, that's that's a thing. I want to point out that Cedric Price plays a big role. And if you if you pick up architectural intelligence, it's chapter five. He's the secret patron saint of interaction <laughs> designers. He is so much fun. It's and so secret that no one that hardly anyone in interaction design might have heard of him, right? Well, we tend to only, well, you've already said that we're not very good at history, yeah, but, yeah. and we've already acknowledged that people aren't good at crossing, crossing disciplinary boundaries. So yeah, yeah. this is my job. Um, <laughs> no, Cedric Price was actually a very well-known British figure. And yeah. if, if we had been around in the 1960s, at least to be engaged with culture at that time, I mean, his wife excuse me, life partner was Eleanor Braun, who was the, she was in the Help movies, the Help, she was in the Beatles movies, she was in Help, right, right. and she was the inspiration for the song Eleanor Rigby. Right, okay. He, yeah, he wasn't known for buildings he built, but he was known for saying things like technology, technology is the answer, but what was the question? That's and, right, you talk about quite a lot of stuff he, he came up with, never got built, right? Yeah, he, it wasn't about the building. Yeah. It was about the thinking about the building. So he, yeah. he changes how we think about things. And one of the things, you know, to bridge into kind of this this idea of how I think about AI and ethics, he, he's sort of a way to, to make that bridge. I think that you need to consider that architecture and design and the work that we do in all of these different disciplines is the kind of instantiation of an ethical decision made at some point, right? We make a decision, mm. we make choices and trade-offs, we have our biases, we do certain things, and then they meet the road, right? Where the rubber meets the road. We, they meet yeah. the road thanks to something we do. And it makes me understand the role of designers and architects as being very vital from an ethics perspective, from an ethics standpoint. Yeah. And um, two years ago, I was awarded an honorary professorship in computation and ethics here at Carnegie Mellon. So there are two of us who hold these, these honorary chairs. And yeah. I used it as an opportunity to look into what what that means. And I, I kind of joke that there was the great ethics boom of 2018 and 2019. <laughs> but now it's, now it's gone away. Well, it's, it's on the decline. I'm actually, I'm doing a study right now with the group called D Sharp, which is our digital humanities group here at Carnegie Mellon, mm -hmm. working with Scott Weingart, Matt Lincoln, and Nick Martellaro to see how the terms AI ethics and design intersect using a corpus of text from medium. So I'm trying to see where AI is an ascending uh, term and ascending right. phrase we use when we start talking about ethics and, and where we don't. And the interesting thing is, if you just look at articles about AI, they're about chatbots and tech and you know different ways to do things. But if you start yeah. looking at ethics, what starts figuring in are the words technologist and designer. 
So when we wow. start considering the role of who we are and not just the tech that we design for is when we as a field start talking about ethics, maybe that's really obvious. And maybe it's really different because I think that what it might mean is something different than human-centered design, like user-centered design. So It's almost like considering ourselves and our own morals and ethics within that design process. And why do you think, I mean, do you not think that's been, we've considered those things in the past as designers? Sure. And I also think <laughs> you that sound we... so unconvinced by that. Well, I mean, we make, there are a lot of examples that, you know, are, are kind of the apocryphal examples like yeah. soap dispensers that won't dispense soap to a dark skin dark skin, hand yeah. or a, a, you know, a, a webcam that will follow a white face and not a dark face. Yeah, That's fine. Yeah. Like I'm sure the people who designed those are perfectly fine human beings, but they didn't think. Yeah. Right. So ethics is a deep and complex and a long has gone out of all those things, got the longest history right. uh, of kind of thinking about it. It often is equated as kind of, oh, we should do the right thing from the perspective of me as the designer and my kind of moral judgments of things. But it's much, much more complex than that. What's your, how do you kind of introduce this idea when you're teaching ethics mm -hmm. and AI? What's the... What are some of the, the core ideas that you think people should examine and get their heads around? Well, that's a really good question. Probably, you know, a whole other I've just triggered a, a whole, whole other series, show. Haven't I? <laughs> There's the entire field of applied ethics, and I'm yeah. not an ethicist. In fact, yeah. I, I consider myself an accidental ethicist. I think a lot of us <laughs> consider ourselves yeah. accidental ethicists, right? We realize yeah. there are yeah. enormous implications for our work. Yeah. But if you look at something like the Markula Center, and that's M-A-R-K-K-U-L-A, mm. -A Center for Applied Ethics, yeah. they might be really interesting for, for your listeners because they, they're based at Santa Clara University in California, and they have curricula, problem sets, you know, ways to kind of think through different approaches to ethics in, say, cybersecurity or software engineering. But in my own classroom, so I teach the first semester Master of Design students the seminar about interaction design and service design concepts. And actually, yeah. my approach to service and interaction design concepts is to look at contemporary technology and to look at questions of bias and ethics and business models between behind tech companies, what AI does, what some history is of where these different ideas come from, and get them to look critically at things that are far bigger than them. You know, it's it's complicated because you think that most of our students are going to graduate and probably work in tech, right? Yeah. So they're yeah. going to be working on these huge systems. And I think that it's important to understand the workings of bias and representation and the effects of the, the racial and gender and sexuality effects of some of these technologies. Yeah. I guess the point I was getting to with the sometimes very simplistic view of ethics, which is, you know, I, I need to just kind of do the right thing as if there is kind of one right thing to be done. And yet my sort of, again, accidental understanding of ethics is much more one of continuous inquiry. And in fact, all of the all the hypotheticals of ethics, you know, in that kind of Socratic dialogue way of talking about ethics, which is to give a scenario and what would you do in this scenario? There's always in those hypotheticals, there's always then, and then you get given an added piece of information, you know, like you, you see someone walking down the street and they drop a, a $50 note. Do you pick it up and kind of give it back to them or not? And then you go, right. oh, yeah, no, they're the right things to pick up. What if that person is, you know, a billionaire robber baron, let's say Donald Trump? who's probably a millionaire, Robber Baron, would you still give it back to them? Oh, no, no, well, I, uh, I don't know. You know, there's all these kind of things where you kind of keep adding layers on onto it and changing the situation. And obviously yeah, people's ethics change all the time because the, the thing about ethics is it, it depends, right? It depends on context. And so one of the things that I thought was an interesting sort of parallel, and I wondered if this is the one that you're kind of drawing, which is it's to do with scale, right? So when we're working on this stuff at scale, and, you know, classically, you know, 1% of Facebook users is several million people. Right? So it's very, very easy to say, well, that's only 1% of our users, but it's actually very many million people. And as we're seeing in the middle of the coronavirus, you know, it's small numbers 
turn out to be an awful lot of people. There's a parallel there with architecture too. Obviously, there's lots of problems in, say, industrial design where something's been created, the automobile, let's say, and goes out in the world sort of multiples of scale and cause all the climate change and sustainability problems. Architecture also has this kind of imposition on human space and human interactions in a, in a very big way. Is there a kind of parallel to be had between those two senses of scale and thinking about working at scale? I mean, architect is also incredibly permanent, right? Well, it's the hardest problem about architecture is that buildings are one of the worst things for the environment. Concrete is, I, I forget the number, I have it written oh, yeah, down it's somewhere, one of the worst but like contributors 30, about, yeah. 40% to, uh, of landfill is, you know, of our dumps is, is yeah. um, construction material. Right now, we're in a position where our cities are empty. We are all in homes and our economic system has plummeted. What we understand a city will be will be different after this. We're going to look differently yeah. when we're able to go out again, and it's going to be a virus that's done that. Now, cities have done that to us before, right? Like you think of cholera, yeah. right? There's yeah, Sir yeah, John. Right. There's there's the John Snow story. John Snow I'm story. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. Everyone know. Well, I should know. I'll put a, a link to it in the yeah, notes yeah. in case people don't know. Yeah. But you know, cities were redesigned from their medieval models in part because of sanitation, in fact, in large part because mm. of sanitation. And, uh, you know, again, it's it's sanitation because of disease. Yeah. And networks, right, because of yeah, my cities have evolved. I live very near Strasbourg in France, and so it's a, mm -hmm. uh, it's a city that was on, you know, real kind of hub of the trade routes across Europe, certainly yeah. from sort of north to south of Europe, and um, also where Gutenberg uh, famously, you know, invented the the printing press. So there's yeah. there's there's this kind of um, amazing history there. It goes backwards and forwards between Germany and France throughout history too. But you kind of see how you know the the cities evolve and change based on based on com commerce and and the economics of it. Well, yeah, based on commerce, but also I think the idea of networks and and water have yeah. interesting connections. So one of my areas, something that I also research is 19th century infrastructure, information right. infrastructure. So I look at postal services, pneumatic tubes, mm. and oh, some I of the earliest. Love those. <laughs> Don't the even get me tubes. started, man. You, oh so my I, gosh. When I was a, so when I was a kid, <laughs> there was a there was a department store in the town that I lived in, and they still had those things. So so again, we're just showing our age here, but they used to. Uh, there's still a few places that have them actually too, mm -hmm. aren't there? Yeah. Uh, and uh, but they so for people that don't know, you have a little, I would say like a kind of tumbler glass size kind of pod, mm -hmm. uh, and that the um, cashier would put a. How would it work? You'd put the they well put some some kind of information inside yeah. those. They'd put it in some. Sometimes the tubes were kind of brass. The ones now are kind of plastic, and it would be sucked up. It was like a vacuum tube. It would be sucked up and end up sort of somewhere else where someone would do something with it, and then it would get sent back down. In these, uh, so, and these, they are fascinating. They're so cool. I have them. Ah, do I have them in here? Yes, I do. I do. Here. Oh, and, um, I'm, not, I'm not recording the video, but there we go. I, I'll have to get you to take a picture of them because it's, it's great. <laughs> this they're is, so cool. uh, yeah, they're magic. In you, fact, you just, I, you just, I have to give away, you just sniffed that because it's obviously got some kind smells, of amazing brass smell or something. It, exactly. It smells like something. It smells like history. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It does. There's a nice number one on it. <laughs> this so is cool. one that would have been used sometime from the 1920s forward inside of a building. But right. yeah, they've. I did a, an interview with Roman Mars's podcast years ago, ninety nine percent invisible about pneumatic tubes. So, oh, I'll I'll look for it and I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah. But the, <laughs> to the point of what we're to the point of what we're talking about, you if you look at early communications infrastructure, communication and finance go together yeah. and and affect how our infrastructures work and affect how our cities work. And our cities are slow to change. I'm, yeah. I'm talking to you from a house of the future and it was built in 1890, right? Wow. You know, it's, it is a house of the future because it has information technology in it. And I'm, I'm able to talk to you in Germany on this podcast because because of, because of information technologies that are yeah. kind of ubiquitous, right? So look, we're coming up to time. Actually, we're sort of been well over time, but it's been fascinating. So let, let's bring it home to, to people who are in the design profession or maybe clients who are 
kind of got client teams working on AI, they're working on some kind of assisted technology, they're working on new products and services. What would be sort of a, a take home message, do you think, to those people? I want to say that, you know, beyond our really big, wide ranging discussion here about mm. technology and history and da da da, there are things that designers do that make us design better technology and in better ways for things that have AI or that are AIs, yeah. right? Um, designers are really good at reframing questions and framing yeah. questions in a bigger kind of way. It's not a matter of this feature, this one little thing, but rather the bigger picture. Um, I like the story of that Shelley Evanson used to tell of, you can, I can ask you to design a vase or I can ask you to come up with a beautiful way to integrate flowers and plants into my daily life. Yeah, design yeah. reframes the question. Yeah, so that's yeah. one thing. I think that designers are able to see implications that that sometimes just engineering focused people can't. Yeah, and I think that designers can understand that we have a whole long design process that isn't just operationalize and optimize, but rather that starts with research and concepting and iteratively prototyping before we come up with this implementation and tweak the implementation phase. And yeah. I have strong concerns about only about tech companies only incentivizing shipping and deployment. Deliver, where, deliver, deliver. Yeah. Yeah. Where this earlier part, you know, again back to Hugh Doverly where we started, he has this compendium compendium of like 130 pages of design processes. Yeah. In yeah the Doverly yeah. Design Office. We have lots of different ways that we can design. And I think that yeah, it's yeah. people like us that can remind that of our teams. That just seems like a good place to, to end. The Power of Ten, as you know, is named after this Eames film, the famous Eames film where they kind of zoom out. And um, it, it came about because I was sort of talking with someone about, you know, this idea of in service design in particular, of zooming backwards and forwards between how a, a small detail can make a large difference. Yeah. And at the same time, a kind of shift at the, at the top end of that zoom in society and as we've seen with the coronavirus right it suddenly kind of changes everything else and, and it kind of ripples down into all the details so the final question is what one small thing that is either well designed and overlooked or uh, needs to be redesigned and, and perhaps is overlooked has or would have an outsized effect on the world it's hard not to think of the coronavirus situation and the fact that something as simple as hand washing, you know, you, you can hoard toilet paper and hand sanitizer, but if you can wash yeah. your hands, certain things are better. But I think the other thing is, I think we're about to find it. And I don't know precisely what it is, but yeah. we're dealing with a point in time right now that's unprecedented where we all have to stay home. And uh, as one friend of mine pointed out, people in her community are moving from grief into anxiety. And now, you know, seven to 13 days in for most people in North America, yeah. we're really starting to hit a fearful time. And it's yeah. going to feel like this for a long time, especially if you're in New York. People, I think, in, in China and Italy know this. So maybe there's something yeah. that we invent now that's very small and very well defined that makes us feel less alone. And it's not Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would be interesting well, to see what comes out of this. And, you know, it makes me think back to that website that I worked on in 1994 and the first online communities I was a part of and the BBSs yeah. before the web. The reason I had the epiphany that I needed to do this internet thing was that it was going to bring together everybody instantly all over the place. And that was the promise. And so I yeah. hope that maybe that's what we're getting back to is some sense of connection through it. After a pretty toxic and uh, era lacking in, in ethics. Huh? So where can people find you online? <laughs> now we come to the reward for, for those of you who sat through, listened through uh, us talking for the last almost hour. Oh um, my gosh, it's what happens when you register a domain name and you're 24 <laughs> years old. You can so find good. me at girlwonder.com. I'm uh, girlwonder.com is my personal site. My book is Architectural Intelligence, How Designers and Architects Created the Digital Landscape. And then Bauhaus Futures is a look ahead from the legacy of the Bauhaus. And we ask if the Bauhaus were around today, what would keep it up at night? Right. Quite a lot, I should think. So, and what about social media? You're on LinkedIn, you're on Twitter. 
I'm on I'm on the social medias. Um, on Twitter, <laughs> I'm Maxi Molly M A X I M O L L Y, and right. I'm also a professor and associate dean at Carnegie Mellon University. I'll put links to it all in the in the show notes. How come you're not Girl Wonder on on Twitter? Was that was it already gone? Um, or had you sort of grown out of it by then? Do you feel? I think it may have been already gone. Every once in a while, someone tries to to grab it for me. The funny thing is, in the from ninety seven to ninety nine, we ran a pop culture feminist webzine called Maxi, okay. and so my name is Maxi Molly from this kind of twenty two year old vestige. It could go to it could go to college to get its own job now. It's such an old yeah. name. <laughs> it's so funny. My the best Twitter handle I know of someone is from Kevin Cheng, who he he wrote a good book called See What I Mean. Yeah. Uh, and he managed to get K, just the letter K as his Twitter <laughs> handle. It's pretty impressive. Old school. Molly, thank you so much. It's been very fascinating. Uh thank you for being Thanks, my Andy. guest on Power of Ten. And Take stay care, safe. Andy. Thank you. You, you too. too. As I'm sure you're aware, you've been listening to Power of Ten. My name is Andy Pullane. You can find me at apolane on Twitter or pullane.com, where you can find more episodes and sign up for my newsletter, Doctor's Note. If you like the show, please take a moment to give it a rating on iTunes. It really helps others find us. And as always, get in touch if you have any comments, feedback or suggestions for guests. All the links are in the show notes. Thanks for listening and see you next time. Listener.